So in this video, I want to talk about the factors that affect resistance. Uh, one of the things that we should be aware of for the MCAT is, in general, that if you took an engineering class, you would be expected to know this stuff in a great bit of detail. You'd expect you'd be expected to know resistance, uh, the the very very detailed aspects of uh, what affect resistance. For the MCAT, the the open secret is that you kind of just need a superficial understanding of everything. You kind of and it helps to have an intuition. So one of the things I'll try and do in this video is to give you an intuition of resistance. So the first and most important factor to affect resistance is, of course, the material. Right, and this is, we talked about this in a previous video that metals uh, have what are called metallic bonds and that allows the electrons to be delocalized. Uh, so some materials are conductors and the examples of these are, let's use a different color, metals, oh that's ugly, that's a little bit too thick of a marker, let's make it thinner. Uh, so we got metals for example. Uh, and we talked about in a previous video how metals, uh, because metals have elect have uh, metallic bonds, the protons are the the nuclei are more or less fixed in the object, and the electrons can kind of float around in different clouds. And so metals are uh, allow electrons to flow very easily. The electrons can kind of just move around. They're 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 not fixed to any one individual nucleus. Um, so metals are very good conductors. Uh, another example of a very good conductor is an ionic solution. That is to say, a uh, some type of a, for example, water. Um, let me draw that bigger, actually. For example, water. And if it has a lot of different ions, a lot of positive and negative charge, negatively charged uh, atoms, um, ions are going to be able to move around, of course. So they're going to move from side to side, uh, up and down, whatever. Um, and so an ionic solution, that is to say water with a lot of, uh, a lot of ions, uh, calcium, chlorine, sodium, potassium, uh, these are all ions, right? It turns out actually what's kind of interesting is that water itself is not a very good conductor. Like pure water uh, is an insulator. So insulators are things that generally do not allow, uh, don't allow electrons to move freely. Right, and because water, of course, is is a is a covalent bond between oxygen and hydrogen, water actually holds on to its uh, to its electrons pretty tightly. So, pure water, for example, uh, pure distilled water, and another example is wood or rubber. Turns out these are pretty bad conductors. They're actually very good insulators. They like to hold on to their electrons uh, pretty tightly. So these are examples of insulators. But it turns out that most water, for example, the water that you get from your tap, is not going to be pure water. It's going to have a lot of ions. Sorry, that's a really bad beaker. Um, it's going to have a lot of ions in it, right? So it's the, the ions are going to be able to move around. They're going to be able to conduct electricity. So water from your tap is a very good conductor. Um, and water, for example, in a river or something is a very good conductor, which is why they say that you should never, um, for example, don't throw a toaster in your bathtub because uh, your bathtub is not pure water. Uh, your bathtub is not an insulator. Your bathtub is going to be water with a lot of ions in it, and uh, those ions are going to conduct electricity. So if you accidentally drop your toaster in your bathtub, um, then uh, that electric charge from the toaster is going uh, to travel all throughout that, that water. Uh, in theory, in, in modern times, of course, uh, we have what are called, uh, um, we, we have things to prevent that. So if you drop your toaster immediately, it'll trigger a um, short circuit and it'll turn off your toaster, which is nice. Um, so no more dying because of toasters dropped in your bathtub. But uh, in theory, it could happen. So these are insulators and conductors. And number one most important thing is a material, is uh, material. Number one most important thing for whether something conducts electricity or not is its material. Okay, number two, however, is temperature. So it turns out that if we have temp, I can't spell temperature today. Temperature. It turns out that if we have two materials or two identical, let's say wires, for example, now it turns out that that the one that's hotter or the one that's cooler is going to be a better conductor. The one that's hotter, the one that's the the one that's uh, has a higher temperature, is going to be 
going to have higher resistance. And one of the ways that you can think about that is what is resist resistance is ultimately just so let me draw out the wire. Let's let me draw out a wire. What resistance kind of is is if we have electrons here and they just zoom through really easily, uh, that means the resistance is low, right? Uh, so if electrons can zoom from one end of the wire to the other, uh, that means that the resistance is very low, right? What happens with temperature is that the that the molecules of the of the of the substance itself of the wire itself now those molecules begin to vibrate. So if your temperature is high, then the molecules begin to vibrate. Um, the molecules are moving, right? And that is going to cause the so now I don't know why I erased that. Uh, let's draw that again. Now we'll draw it in gold, I guess. So now what's going to happen is when the electrons are moving through, uh, they're not just going to zoom through when it's hot because the, the because it's vibrating. The, the, they're going to bump into the sides, right? Everything is moving. Everything is vibrating. So there's higher resistance. So turns out temperature increases resistance. So high temperature low temperature. And uh, one of the ways you can get an intuition for that is, as I said, that, that you can think of it as the electrons bumping into the sides of the wire and things. Uh, you can also understand that, that um, if you've ever uh, understood, if you've ever seen uh, computer, uh, the way that people uh, deal with computers, for example, uh, people are very concerned about cooling uh, their computers. They're very concerned about, um, about cooling their CPUs. And um, they're very concerned, for example, about if you have a server, you want to you want to make sure that the um, uh, you want to make sure that the temperature is low because uh, the lower temperature is going to mean lower resistance. It's going to mean faster processing. So if, for example, you were to heat up your laptop, it would slow down. Uh, if you were to to keep your laptop in a cool in a cool place, it would uh, it would move faster. It would work better. Uh, so temperature. And now the third and fourth factors don't have to do with properties of the material. Uh, they have to do with, let me move this. They have to do with the, what we do with the material. So let, let, me, let me explain what I mean by that. Oops, okay. This won't let me move it. Okay, so number three, factor number three is the thickness of the material or the thickness of the wire. So, and you can think of this in the way that we discussed last time, we discussed previously about how um, you have a, let's say a pipe and you have electrons moving through it and they're bumping into the sides and that's resistance, right? Well, in which pipe are they going to bump into the sides more? Is it going to be the, the thicker one or is it going to be the thinner one? And we know that it's going to be that the electrons are going to bump into the sides a lot more in the, in the thinner one. Whereas in the thicker one, even if they even if they're moving a little bit, they're still gonna, they're not gonna bump into the sides as much, right? So it turns out that a thicker wire has lower resistance and a thinner wire has higher resistance. Okay, so thickness, number three is thickness. And number four, number four, I'm gonna move down a little bit. Number four is the length of the wire. And this is relative, I think, pretty self-explanatory. Um, a longer wire, all other things being all other things being equal, a longer wire is going to have a lot more resistance than a shorter wire. Right? So if you were setting up your uh, your computer, for example, you're setting up a server, you you don't want your wires to be too long because that's just going to increase resistance for, for no good reason. Uh, when you're setting up, for example, um, it turns out that when they set up uh, electric, um, when they, when they set up the electrical grid, uh, that a, a big amount of energy or a decent amount of energy is lost to the resistance because, of course, they're spanning the wires are spanning very very long distances. Um, so, of course, length uh, of the wire, uh, a longer wire is going to have higher resistance, and a shorter wire is going to have lower resistance. Right. And okay, so good. So now, one of the the last thing that I I think we should be aware of. So we should be aware of these four factors, and we should be aware of an equation that we can use to represent these factors. So that equation is let me change the color so that we can let's do let's do pink. I like pink. So that equation is going to be 
resistance. This is a little bit too thick of a marker. Get thinner. Resistance is going to be equal to a property called rho times the length of the wire divided by its cross-sectional area. And what does this mean? Well, first, let's go through it. Rho is resistivity. Not resistance, but resistivity. Resistivity allows us to compare two wires uh, or two materials. So for example, let's say I have, uh, let's say I have this wire. Let's say this wire is copper. Or let's say this wire is gold, actually. And then let's say I have, let's say I've also got this wire. Let's say this wire is copper, right? So how do we compare these two? How do we compare these materials? Not just the, not just the, the resistance of the particular wires, but the materials in general. And what we use is we use rho. Rho is a res it gives us resistivity uh, without including the, the length of the wire or the cross-sectional area of the wire. So resistivity, of course, would depend on the material and its temperature, right? Um, so uh, it basically doesn't include the, the last two factors, the thickness or the length of the wire. Um, so what, resistivity is a constant for a given material at a given temperature. Equals, let's say, x. This one has a rho equals y, right? And now if we wanted to figure out the, resist, the resistance of a particular wire, what we would do, let's use the pink again, resistance. We would take the, that row value for the given material, and we would multiply it by the length of the wire divided by its cross-sectional area. Now, why is this important? It's not actually that important for the MCAT. This particular equation is, uh, is not that important for the MCAT. Um, but what is important is to understand the, what this equation means. Because the length is on the top, that means that as length increases, resistance increases. And because cross-sectional area is on the bottom, that means that as cross-sectional area increases, uh, resistance decreases, right? So understanding which side of the, oops, understanding which side of the equation or whether it's on the top or the bottom uh, tells us uh, its relationship to resistance. And um, yeah, so that is how you calculate, would calculate resistance if you were given a row value, you were given resistivity um, uh, for a given material.